On behalf of the McConnell Foundation, we welcome you to this community event. Unsung heroes are Lao and Mian allies in the secret war. Thank you to our McConnell Foundation board members for your support of this event. Uh, to those of you who could be here, we really appreciate it. Uh, Bob Blankenship, Dee Domke, uh, Dick Stemple, and Judy, thank you also for coming. Um, I'm Jessica Rohn. I'm the Director of International Programs for the McConnell Foundation. Um, today is a result of a big collaboration contributed to by many and guided by our steering committee. May I just have a show of hands for our steering committee members, please? So if you have questions about this event, want more information, those are the people you can talk to. They've put so much into it. So the McConnell Foundation has funded work on access to justice in Laos since 2006. But in the past couple of years, we've been trying to do more um, to link our work in Laos with our local community here. Uh, one of those efforts was to partner with the Center for Laos Studies to offer the Study Abroad in Laos program. And thank you to the Center for Laos Studies staff uh, who were able to make it here today from San Francisco. Thanks a lot for coming to join us. Um, and the more people that I spoke to here in our area, the more certain we all became that these life stories needed to be told uh, again or for the first time. Today's event centers on six brave people willing to share before an audience their very personal stories. And this event is focused on our Mian and Lao allies in the war simply because that's the majority population here in our area. We have about 2,500 Mian people in the area and about 500 Lao, and the other groups are much smaller. But in no way do we diminish the role played by Mong, Lahu, Akka, and everyone else who's been involved. Um, many of you here know more about this than I do, so I apologize if I'm stating the obvious or if I make mistakes. But I wanted to do my best just to uh, remind us all of a few basic ground rules and sensitivities as we start. It can be a common perception to think of people from Laos as a more or less homogenous group, when actually there couldn't be a more diverse group of people from such a small piece of land. As a small example, the majority of Lao people are from the plains of Laos, speak Lao, and are mostly Buddhist. Um, Mian people um, are primarily from the highlands, uh, mountainous regions, speak Mian, which is more similar to Mandarin than Lao, and are traditionally Taoist. Uh, of course, a lot of Lao and Mian people are Christian and are part of the strong faith communities here. Um, but within this very room, there are Laotian people who are Mian, Lahu, Mong, La Lum, Lao Tung, Buddhist, Taoist, Christian, non-religious, male, female, young, old, subgroups of subgroups, regional differences. Um, I also want to recognize all of the American Vietnam veterans who are here today, who, whether they knew it or not at the time, were fighting alongside our allies 
in the secret war in Laos and are here with their own experiences and perceptions. Also in this room are pastors, shamans, native council members. <laughs> so with all of that said, um, this is a space for respectfully honoring someone else's story. It might not match your own, and that's okay. Um, it's so important to be able to fully share the story of who you are and the experiences that formed you, and to make space to accept that in someone else. We're all in this together. Um, but, you know, sometimes we get comfortable with a splinter that's been buried under the skin for a long time, and to dig that out can really hurt. So, with, you know, we invite you, if at any time, if this brings up hard memories for you, take a breath of air, it's absolutely fine. Um, we hope that you come back, because a lot of good things come in the Q&A section at the end. Um, sometimes, you know, we all live amongst each other and can completely miss the real value in our neighbors by not taking the time to listen just a little bit deeper. I know I have been completely blown out of the water to learn what people who I thought I knew had been through. Sometimes those conversations are hard to start. <laughs> so to help us start those conversations today, um, I'd like to welcome our friend Mike Dahl. Great, thank you, Jessica. So my name is Mike Dahl. I am a combat Marine, and I served two tours of duty in Vietnam. And I also grew up here in Shasta County. And I remember back in the 60s going to school, we were taught about American exceptionalism and our melting pot, which we can see today. We were also taught about um, far off lands and current events. We learned about uh, French colonialism, Indochina, uh, the occupation of the Japanese during war World War II, and some place called Dien Bien Phu. I guess we were taught about Laos, but I don't really recall. At the time, most of us probably weren't paying attention, and it wasn't relevant to us. However, what we were paying attention to was the escalating war in Vietnam and the draft. Because some of us were going to go over and fight that war. But the war was on the night, nightly news, nightly, on all three networks. It was our first television war. And for you baby boomers, like Chief Blankenship out here, um, you'll probably remember Walter Cronkite and John Chancellor and David Brinkley. And the 1960s were truly a crazy and chaotic time. I mean, we had a rock and roll revolution going, we had a counterculture movement, we had a civil rights movement. Uh, we had an anti-war movement and a continuously widening generation gap. But thinking back to Shasta County in the 60s, much like we are today, it was a very rural and conservative community. And most of our parents supported the war in Vietnam. This was part of the fight against spreading communism. Because thinking back then, when we grew up, we had the Red Scare. We had bomb shelters. There were nukes going to Cuba. The atrocities of Stalin and Mao Zedong were coming forward. The Berlin Wall. You know, the spread of communism was a real threat. So in early 1967, I became a U.S. Marine. And I was ready for the fight. You know, the few, the proud, the Marines. So fast forward, it's Christmas Eve, 1967. We weren't thinking about presence under the tree. Our plane landed in an airfield near Da Nang, Republic of South Vietnam. And we were just in time for the infamous Tet Offensive, which is gonna break out in about a month. So the Tet Offensive, along with the escalating war in Vietnam, continued to make the nightly news and the daily headlines. And the war zone was teeming with writers and journalists and photojournalists. It was the first television war. I mean, it was truly transparent. And the public could see in living color in their living room each night the graphic mud 
and blood. The body counts were issued uh, each evening, like the weather report or the stock market. That includes the 46 men from Shasta County that are in that poster as you walked in the room. And a lot of those guys Bob and I went to high school with. For some, those are just statistics, and for others, those are funerals. So the world's first truly transparent war was always also very opaque and covert. And there were secrets, and there were dark secrets. See, there was a parallel war being waged in a small country to the west of us in Laos. And it was a secret war. And it had an anti-communist army that was created by our CIA. Now, once we were deployed to Nam, or the Nam as we called it, Laos became a familiar name, unlike in high school, because that was the source of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And you can see the Ho Chi Minh Trail on the map to my left. Laos was in the wrong place at the wrong time because this was the supply artery for the North Vietnamese and the Chinese to bring men and munitions from the north to the south to kill us. And the trail led to the creation and expansion of the secret army and the massive bombing campaign. So, you know, keeping secrets always hard, but keeping a secret this big is, is really astonishing. So consider this. Laos is the size of Utah. There were 260 million cluster bombs dropped on Laos in this period. 260 million. That's more bombs that were dropped in all of Europe during World War II. Think about that. Laos became the most heavily bombed country in the history of mankind. 30% of those bombs never went off. Some are going off to this day. The kingdom of a million elephants became the kingdom of a million bombs. And the, secret the, the CIA had a secret army of thousands fighting the communists, and it was all a secret. So although we were fighting the same war against the same enemy at the same time, there were many differences in our wartime experiences. So if you're from Shasta County, like me, you came home from the war full circle. You came back to Shasta County from where you started, and you came back one of three ways. You came back in a body bag or casket, you came back as a wounded warrior, or you came back whole but forever changed. Now, when we got home, we were not welcome. Um, it was unpleasant. We were disdained, we were disrespected, and we were rejected by our peers. But we were home. Now, if you were one of our Lauer men colleagues in the war, you could not go home because home was a re-education camp in the new communist paradise, a POW camp, or an execution squad. So our Lao comrades had to make the long and dangerous journey, which was much different to Shasta County, and become part of our melting pot as the latest wave of immigrants that makes America what it is today and our community richer for them. And that is a story we're going to share today. It's a story of courage, resiliency, strength, and heroism. And the, the history of Vietnam is still an incomplete book. Today we're gonna to write about six more chapters. And as a proud Marine and a proud Vietnam veteran, I extend to all of you, welcome home, Lao and Mien veterans. Welcome home, unsung heroes, and thank you for serving. This time I'm gonna turn it over to Trent Copeland. And Trent probably does not need an introduction. He's a longtime academic, a friend of the Lao Mien community, and he's going to help introduce us to our six speakers and stories. Trent? Thank you. Uh, I'll be very brief here, but I, I have to say the first speaker uh, has a very special place in my own uh, history in that he, uh, his daughter was the first student in my first class as a teacher at Nova High School. Uh, Hong Kam was her name. 
and I was delighted to get to meet him again after 31 years and his wonderful wife. So uh, with no more on that, uh, Mr. Sankyo Suryasang uh, from Hoisai, Laos. Mr. Suryasang, if you will, please. ขอบใจนำมูลนิธิที่ให้เกียรติแก่ข้าพเจ้าได้มาประกอบความคิดความเห็นในมือนี้ตอนนี้ไปเมื่อข้าพเจ้าจะได้เล่าประวัติการเป
that was supported by the Americans and also the Vientiane government. And that's when I moved uh, to Hue Sai uh, in 1973 after that. So the uh, northern uh, the northern uh, SGU unit comprised of uh, three uh, battalion of uh, Lao Lum, the lowland Lao, and three battalion of the uh, Lao Sung, which is um, midland Lao, and then Lao Teng, uh, so three uh, battalion as well. And together, three, these three, uh, nine battalion uh, support each other and uh, fought uh, alongside each other, uh, especially at Long Jiang. <laughs> อเมริกาได้ยุทธเซาการช่วยเหลือฝ่ายเวียงจันทร์ตอนนี้พวกเขาทหารฝ่ายเวียงจันทร์ถือบังคับเอาอาวุธปลดอาวุธฝ่าย
ต่อนั้นไปข้าพเจ้าก็ยานไหลก็เลยหูละอื้อเบิดเขาห้องมาแล้วเขามือซี่เนี่ยพูนั่นพูนั่นข้าพเจ้าบอซี่ใส่เอิบข้าพเจ้าเพราะว่าไม่ได้ยินทุกคนได้เห็นนี่นี่คำนั้นเขาซี่ใส่เขาว่าบอแมนแล้วก็แบบอะไรเขาซี่ผู้ได้ซี่ใส่เนี่ยเอิบเขาตอนหัวแล้วก็แบบเรื่องอะไรออกไปไปความหยาดกลัวของเขาคือตัวเขาเนี่เย็นขึ้นน้ำก่อนมันนะหมูหูอย่างเลยหูอืบเพื่อตอนนั้นนะ so while I was at the re-education camp again um, normally they would have uh, meetings group meetings and at this time I remember one incident uh, it was very scary to me because they would call uh, 32 people at that time uh, the first 10 I could could still hear them and I was one of the uh, uh, high-ranking officials there, and and uh, I see um, you know other people got called, and uh, I was very scared because I, I was scared that they're gonna call my name. And the first ten, like I said, I, I can hear very well, but after the first ten, my mind just went numb and my body just froze because I was too scared that they're gonna call me. Long after that, they hear the call. They call me to the team. แล้วนี้สิบสองคนแต่ว่าสองคนเขาเอามาตัดสินอยู่ในค่ายของเขาหันอีกเขาหาเรื่องใส่ว่าคนเขาจะเห็นรัฐประหารเขาเขาแตกเรื่องใส่แล้วเขาถามบอกว่าโทษคันนี้นี่ควรขังตลอดชีวิตบอหรือควรขาดทีมวันนี้พวกเขาไปตัดสินอยู่หันพวกนายหมวดนายหมวดนายหมูทหารเขาพวกนายบานแต่แช่งเขาก็เอาไปเบิดวันนี้เขาอยู่ทั้งสเตทเห็นเขายกมือว่าให้ขาดทีมเบิดมันได้พวกเขาเนี่ยนั่งขึ้นเนี่ยนั่นแล้วก็เลี้ยวเหมือนกันเขาก็ทั้งหนาเนี่ยยกเมื่อคืนฉันนี่ยันนั่นเขาว่ายกให้สูงๆยกให้สูงให้ยกมัดดิโอ้กันพวกจะให้ขาดก็เอาไปขาดแล้วคนสองคนเนี่ยไปขาดทีมสิบคนเนี่ยขาดวันได้กับบุหูไปเขาขาดพวกร้อยเอกมัดของกองทัพมาสิบสองคน So I learned that later on that they actually executed uh, 12 out of the 32 that was called and two of them and two more came back to the meeting and it was asked uh, by all the um, detentionees, I guess, the, the people were there, uh, what should we do with these two people because they're gonna revolt against everybody, against the government, uh, and they asked everybody to vote. Should we put them in prison for life or should we execute them now? And so people were scared. They, they sort of didn't want to say no to the execution so they would raise their hand, maybe just a little bit like this, but then say, no, raise your hand all the way, um, all the way to, you know, as high as you can. So he, he had no choice and everybody had no choice but to raise their hand and say, yes, we uh, approve and we vote to execute these two. And so they killed the two people that was left. So two years later, after my wife passed away, uh, 1978, uh, I remarried uh, Miss Gai Son and then uh, was transferred to Sien Kuang. Sien Kuang was a man who 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 was a man. So when I was at Sien Kuang, one of my duties was to uh, dig uh, a canal uh, to, to transfer water into the rice field. And at that time, uh, we dug into Bambi, as Mike was saying, the, the, one, the, the one that was dropped from the plane. And one exploded and killing two of his friends and uh, hurt two. You mong kham anan tuk tuo tuk bon men mi mak bum bi mat kao pe si hai pokka kao pe chao thang hai ao kao pu khana le pa hen mak bum bi la hao khoi khut ok la khoi ma wang man bu te po mak bum bi bum bi kep yu thang nok kep man yu thang nai la man mi luk kam phai len thang nai thao chap la ma kweng ni man chi te thao chap ma la khoi ma wang wang ni ฉะนั้นพวกข้าพเจ้าถางให้แล้วก็เก็บมันมากองนับปีหลายหลายร้อยหน่วยจนมาอันไม่แห้งแล้วจึงจูดแล้วมันเกิดแตกแล้วก็บุมีไผ่เป็นอย่าง so also one of my responsibility was to clear uh, upland rice field 
and uh, with the clearance of the upland rice field, there's al also a lot of bombies, so I have to be very careful when I, um, when I find one. I have to transfer it and put in piles of hundreds, and then later on we would burn and it would detonate, it would explode. So we have to be careful handling the, the bombies because um, uh, the one good thing about bombies is that uh, it's not like a grenade where they, um, where when you detonate it, it's on the outside, you pull it, it's actually on the inside. Uh, so if you um, transfer it, you can, uh, you know, you have to be careful, and that's uh, what, what I did. So the bombies, uh, just to let you know, it's, it's probably the size of a tennis ball if, uh, if you, if you, in comparison. And um, the litter everywhere in, 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 uh, in Laos, in, um, the rice field and land, even up in trees, in bamboos, because when they fall, they get stuck and uh, in branches and trees, so they're everywhere. And it takes a long time for them to detonate. มีครั้งนึงข้าพเจ้าขุดดินถ้าโศกบุรีก็แปลว่าข้าพเจ้าก็บริมาปากอยู่นี่แหละเพราะว่าขุดไปไปตําใส่อันมากบุ๋มบี
there to you, and if you have anything valuable, money, gold, whatever, they would take it, and sometimes they would even kill you as well. So for me, I was, I was um, caught by the border uh, patrol in, uh, in Thailand, and they want to send me back to Laos. Um, so to me, I was thinking, if they send me back, I'm going to be dead. My family's going to be dead. They're going to kill me for sure. So I bargained with the border control and said, okay, if you're going to send me back, might as well kill me now and kill my family because what's the difference? I'm going to die anywhere you send me back. <coughs> so that's when the border patrol uh, decided to take me in and, um, and took me to the refugee camp in Thailand in Napo. You know, Napo, so on, in February uh, 1986, they sent me to the refugee camp in the Philippines. Uh, so I first came to the United States on September 4th, 1986, and then four days later, uh, I came to Reading, and I've been there. Ever, I've been here ever since. คนเราก็ยังมาบ่หลายมีแต่สิบปลายครัวและมีบางคนอเมริกาก็บ่แม่นส่วนหลายเนี่ยมีบางคนเท่านั้นที่คือว่าบ่พอใจนะพวกอพ
ย้อนมาหน่อยโอ้อันเรื่องบอกความความฝันเวลามาหอดอเมริกาใหม่ใหม่ภายในสิบปีนี่ความฝันของข้าพเจ้ายังตื่นอยู่เรื่อยๆคือว่าข้าพเจ้าวางแผนจินหนีเพราะว่าอยู่หันเขาวางแผนจินหนีอยู่ตลอดเวลานะว่าเขาหนีไปแล้วไปเห็นกองร้อนเขาเห็นทหารเขาเขานะแล้วก็ตื่นตกใจเป็นอยู่ในนั้นเรื่อยๆแล้วก็ถาบก็ร้อนที่ว่าเขาจับคนเท่าเขาเฮ็ดขนาบผมเห็นคนเท่านะมันมันร้อนอยู่เรื่อยเลยเห็นคนตายคนยังฮะที่นี่ได้หายแล้วหลายปีแล้ว Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to finish the translation. I think we're good here. Uh, so when I first came to U.S., uh, I would have nightmares uh, almost every night for the, the first 10 years. Um, I guess you would classify this as uh, PTSD. Um, of the time I was in the re-education camp, I would, uh, you know, dream about me escaping the camp or leaving uh, Laos to the refugee camp. I would get caught, and then you know, all of a sudden you wake up. And so these nightmares would happen would happen almost every day for for 10 years, for the first 10 years. Um, it was very hard. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the last three he would like to um, ask is you know for maybe the U.S. government to uh, recognize uh, the service of um, the Lao veterans. That I served uh, during that time because we did fought under the the U.S., um, especially the SGU, uh, the Special Guerrilla Unit, and even have some sort of benefit, if possible, uh, for us serving in in the military for that time. And second, uh, uh, we'd like to ask if possible for the Meccano Foundation to support the community here, which they already been doing. Uh, maybe have some sort of um, uh, a center. Or, or some sort of programs where uh, you know we're able to educate our own uh, children and also other uh, community members about the history and what went on during the Vietnam War, the Secret War, and why the people here are here in Reading, especially the the, the refugees from Laos. Um, and and I think that's lastly, like to wish everybody uh, good health, uh, prosperity, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to speak next with uh, uh, Yunam, and Yunam is going to be speaking on behalf of his father who passed away a few years back, um, Mong Sio. And uh, without anything more from me, Yunam, please. First of all, I would like to thank the Makano Foundations and the Unsung Hero Planning Committees for having me here today. <coughs> Before I share my father's stories, I would like to share a brief short history of the Mian migrations. We, the Mian people, once have our own land. Our people were living in southern China, <clears throat> living, living in southern China for many, many thousands of years, until the, until the Chinese came and they found us. The Mian people believe that we are the descendant of a king named King Pan of Bien Hung. The first mention of the Yumian come through a mythical stories of King Pan's, a five-colored dog man. The tale of Bien Hung was written in around 200 CE. That's the first the Chinese historian has uh, uh, mentioned about King Pan. And so for, may, for many thousands of years, uh, we have lived in southern China, the Ch and then they came and found us, and they the Chinese want us to become them. They want us to assemble, to, to, to assemble their, their cultures. They want us to be them. But we say, no, we are our own people. So the Mian people and the Chinese government have been fighting for many, many, many hundreds of years. And thousands of Mian have died. And so I'm going to move forward a thousand years. The year 1260 CE, is, that is the year the Mian and the Chinese have an a agreement. They signed a peace treaty. That peace treaty says that the Mian people, the Chinese says, either face genocide or become us, or you can become your own people and go live up in the mountain. So our people have decided to go live up in the mountain. The Chinese emperor gave us a passport. 
in Mien, we call it GSN Pong, a passport to roam up the mountain freely without paying tax to the Chinese. But in one condition, we cannot venture down to lowland to live. Like I say, we, our land is known as today at Guangdong, Guangxing, and Hunan province. That was the Mien nation. That is where the Mien was, was, uh, <clears throat> was living. So for another 500 years, we were living from mountain slope to mountain slope doing slash and burn to clear up the mountains so we can plant our rice, plants our vegetables. We have been doing that for 500 years. Now I'm gonna move forward 500 years to the 1700. The year 1700, late 1700, one of the group of the Mian people has moved uh, uh, into Vietnam. So our people, the Mian people, immigrate to uh, Vietnam, late 1700, but the native people doesn't like us. They don't like us. They say, you guys are foreigners. You're, you come in here undocumented, you guys are illegal immigrants. So, yeah, they were the Lu people. They called the Lu people at that time, they were the dominant group. In southern China, northern Laos, northern Vietnam, the Lu, the Thai Lu, the Lu people, they were the dominant group. And so, some of the Mian folks stay and comply with the native people. Some have uh, moved back to China. And so, the Mian people are still battling with the Chinese, even though in the even though in the late 1800s. The last uprising were in Guangxing, near Guangxing, Hunan, and Guangdong borders. The year 1832, 15,000 Yu Mian heads has been cut off by the Chinese, and another 10,000 in the year 1850, according to the book that's written by uh, uh, Litz Jinzer and Cushman's story. <clears throat> so. In the late 1800s, the Yumin people have finally arrived in the northern of Laos. In Laos, the Mian people live in three regions, Luang Prabang, uh, Sanyabuli, and Luang Nam Tha. In the, in the late 1800s, there were two Yumin leaders. The Lu people give them the title of Pilong, that's in Mian that's equivalent to the title of prince. So the two Yumin leaders were struggling, they want power. One of them wanted to control all the Mian people. So one of the Yumin Pilong has moved to Thailand. He brought his people and moved across the Mekong River to Thailand in the late 1800s. And now we have only one supreme Yumin leader in Laos. His name is uh, Pilong Wenzhoi Lin. He's the grandfather of uh, Yao San of Oakland. I don't know if you guys know him or not. And so, <clears throat> Mian people has been living in northern Laos in the late 1800s until the 1975. That's when the end of the uh, Civil War. Now I'm gonna share with you my, the story of my father, my father's story. My father was born in Morpea village of northern Laos in 1950. Total, he has four sisters, and three brothers, and he was the eldest son. My father worked in the farm with my grandfather, doing slash and burn, growing vegetables, raising farm animals, pigs and chickens, and we were very poor. Our family, my grandfather was very poor. So my father didn't get a chance to go to school until he was at the age of 17. My father started Lao Elementary School in first grade at the age of 17. By the time he was aged of 18 and a half, he had completed third grade of Lao Elementary School. In 1969, um, <clears throat> at that time, the Mian leader, Zhao uh, La, Si Song Fa and Zhao Mai, Si Song Fa, the, <clears throat> the son of the, the Pilong Wen Tsai, they were our Mian leaders. This is that each family have to send one son to fight the war to fight against the communists. So my father, as the oldest son, he has volunteered to go because his younger brother has never had a chance to go to school yet. And, he, and so my father says, okay, I volunteer, I go. So my father went to training in Namu, Namu, northwestern of Laos. 
for uh, as as uh, radio operator Nasai, that's in uh, Mian. It's called Nasai or in Lao called Nasai. So he was. By the time he turned the age of 19, he completed his training. He got his certificate, and he was uh, with the Royal Lao Army for four years. In 1973, 1972, then my father got married and had me. I was born in 1972. And then um, <clears throat> he became a farmer again. And we were my, my, my father and his brothers and his, my grandfather, they're all farmer again. But by the year 1973, the Namgyu area, uh, Namking area, uh, that's when the communists were getting very close, very, very close. So my, we, mm -hmm. the whole village, have decided to escape in 1973, in gen late January 1973, because that's the time of our Lunar Festival New Year's, and that's when everybody didn't even have time to celebrate our New Year yet. And we all have to just move, and I was only three months old at that time. So when we crossed the Biakong River, we ended up staying in a Chiang Rai province, of Chiang Rai province, Thailand. We stayed in a village called Maibong, Maibong village in, in, um, in Chiang Rai province from 1973 to 1980. And <clears throat> our village got burned down in 1980, and it was the same time of the year during the Lunar Festival New Year's. And uh, our village got burned down, so we have no more place to stay. So my father ended up going to the city the, uh, uh, to speak to the mayor. And also, he also went to Chiang Kham, refugee camp, to speak to our Yemen leader, Wen Jian. And also went to uh, Chiang Kong, refugee camp, to speak to uh, Zhao La. He was in, the, he was in a, a Chiang Kong refugee camp. And so the Thai government came, they gave us some Food and the leaders from uh, Chiang Kham and Chiang Kong, the Mian people also came, all support, give us some blankets, and um, we have no place to live, but we, were st we got pots and pans. So my father had decided to come to the state, to have decided to go into the refugee camp. The only reason why we didn't go into refugee camp early in the 75 when they, it was built, it was because my, my grandfather didn't want to come. He says, I would rather die in my homeland than go to a foreign country where I cannot understand them. I don't speak their language. So that's why we, my father, our family, didn't go into the camp until 1980, until our village got burned down. So my father and us and my, my four siblings, we all went into the camp. My grandfather stayed behind. We, my family arrived in uh, November 16. <coughs> 1980 in Portland, Oregon. And my father, I mean, my grandfather is still back there in Thailand. He didn't want to come. So um, two years later, in 1982, that's when my grandfather passed away. And my father fell in that deep depression because he, in Mian costume, in Mian cultures, as the eldest son, it is your responsibility to take care of your younger siblings, also take care of your parents. And he felt that he didn't do that for his parents. So he, in Mian culture, when your, parent, when your mother or father die, the son have to hold the parent's head to show them respect. And he didn't get to do that for his father. So he got very depressed, and he started drinking heavily. He think that the alcohol is going to help cure his pain. And he's been, he has been an alcoholic for a long time. And he passed away in 2008 in Redding, California. Thank you. That's my story. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Yunnam. Um, our next guest is uh, Income Manisai. Please. Oh, thank you very much. I would like to thank you, uh, Nakano Foundation, to invite me to participate uh, today. <coughs> I would like to introduce me just a little bit. I think it's not long, like a, two of them, <laughs> like a mystery. <laughs> <coughs> My name is Income 
มาเน็กใส่ลักอินคัมแท็กไม่เอวิบาร์ดีกันมีเนียนมาเนียมฮะวิดามาเนียมโนอินคัมฮะ I was born in Laos in countryside กับพาอุดม province of b o k h e l 1951 I was born and after I graduate 1969 1970 I can be mili uh, what do you call it mili police military military or mili military military police 1970 that's my first job after I graduate and to 1972 and I changed my mind I can be looking another job I can be go to a nurse school for study nurse military 1973 till 1975 communists took over the country and harassed me and sent me to POW Close to border to uh, Dien Bien Phu, about 30, 30 kilometers. About compare a mile, how many miles can be? 15 miles. Far away from everybody. And on that time, I could work hard and not enough food. Everything is left. That could be around two, three years. They're gonna give us a, a chain a little bit. The time they on sleep at night time, they have the guard to guard us all the time. Go to take shower in the stream. They can follow to everywhere they follow us. I try to to be nice and do everything. They let them trust me, and I be like a lucky. Uh, 1978, they, they need people to have education. <laughs> uh, on that time, they need uh, accounting. I don't know, I'm so lucky they pick up me, they pick me. I didn't do for my job for the nurse. They pick me for the do for the accounting, help them. Lucky and uh, work close them. Try to be nice all the time. After that, 1986, I could remember for the month, for the day. They sent me out of the camp. That time, I saw a lucky time. I can escape and get my family out. I try to stay with my parents. My parents don't have anybody to uh, take care of. Only me, first son, I can't. They try to follow me and arrest me again and escape to Thailand, 1986. On that time, we come to Thailand, the Thai police arrest me again. They want to send me to the Lao. They said, I'm, I am communist. I said, no, I'm not communist. I escaped from POW camp. They know they want to see me. If you want to see me, I can say like a song here. Uh, sorry. If you want to send me to the Lao, please kill me in here. If you go to Lao, they're going to kill me either. Kill me in here, the better than send me to Lao. So that the, you have anything to uh, uh, record, uh, confirm or you have anything to you be uh, in the army in Laos? Yes, I have picture. I have a nurse uh, uh, certificate, military. I carry with me. So lucky on that time, I saw them. And they, after that, they sent me to the jail, 36 day in the jail with my kid. My, two, my one kid right there, dog, dog cub. <coughs> On that time, I sleep, I can be 36 night, can be 36 night, Mos mosquito, they buy me 36 night. 
I thought I can, uh, I can be my life can be in there. I could believe I can be I have a new life in America. And then until to 1987, come to a, a, what they call it called a PRPC in Philippine camp, a six month after that. Till August. 24, 1987, came to United States at the San Francisco airport at 5 o'clock p.m. On that time, my uh, brother can be sponsor me. Live in the San Jose. I can live in San Jose only two months. Everything too expensive. And they said, oh, we have uh, another towel, like a, send me to Reading. October 24, 2087, again, same day, but different month. We live in San Jose only two months, and I moved up to uh, Reading. And until 19, 1998, I try to do a business, uh, do, make a donut, open donut, so many donut in a Sasta Lake, that's my. Have a, on that time, I have two kids, a uh, dog coming right there. Uh, Dorothy is not born yet, I have two daughters in there. <coughs> oh, daughter, uh, she's born already in 1988. And 1998, I opened my business, a donut shop, five years until 19, uh, 2003. I sold my business and I worked at a KMS. You know KMS in Reading? I worked there seven years. 2006, I moved down to uh, BLA and get a job over there right now. And we work at uh, Parker Hennepin in the Richmond Bay till now. That's how I can say my story. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Incom. For those of you who may not have caught that, it was 11 years in a POW camp to be thrown in jail, 36 days in Thailand. But a uh, remarkable story. And we will move on to another good friend of mine, Mecho Sechao, or Mecho Lee, I'm sorry. Hang on, I'm going to talk to you about the next time. I'm going to talk to you about the next time. I'm going to talk to you about the next time. I'm going to talk to you about the next time. I'm going to talk to you about the next time. I'm going to talk to you about the next time. I'm going to talk to you about the next time. Mine's going to be a little bit different. I apologize. There's a lot of familiar faces, so you've, all of you probably already heard my story or my family's story. So I'm going to go at a different angle. Um, I ask that you um, cooperate as much as you can as long as your health permits you. If you would either close your eyes during my time or refocus on the ground, on a chair. Uh, um, I just don't want you to focus on the panel up here. Because I think that it's important for um, each of you to experience or try to follow the storyline rather than um, who I am today, which may confuse or uh, may not have the same impression or impact. Unsung heroes, a person whose bravery is unknown or acknowledged or unacknowledged. First of all, I appreciate and want to say thank you to our service men and women as well as to our families for their service and day-to-day -day sacrifice in order to provide the freedom we have today. Secondly, I would like to thank and acknowledge grandparents, parents, elders, uncles, and brothers for their service during the Vietnam War, Secret War, which has made it possible for me and others to be here today. It was a painful, frightening, and traumatic experience because some of us have lost loved ones during the war or the journey, escape, journey escaping from Laos to Thailand. However, I am still grateful because it has given me opportunities, freedom, and a new beginning. For those that don't know me, my name is Zio Lei Meizou, also known as Mei Chao Li. I am the eldest daughter, giving me the first part of my name, Mei. 
My parents are first generation immigrants and I am one and a half generation. I came to the United States before my teenage years. I am Mian or Iu Mian, the former. Each of us have our own stories. Some have positive memories and laughter, others with sadness and painful memories. When one hears Vietnam War, you see nodding of the head. But when you say the secret in loves, you see confusion and you have, they, they know, they don't know what you're saying. And confirmation of chaos. Imagine, in your own home, in your own background, your backyard, your town, your country, where little children are playing around, grandparents, women, pregnant women walking around, getting bombed at constantly, not knowing who's at risk of dying the next day, the next second, not knowing who your enemies are. Is your neighbor really your neighbor, or is it the communist soldier? Just imagine that as we take this journey through my family's life. And also keep in mind, I was a young child. The stories I tell you are my impression as a young girl. It may not be similar to you, but it's a young girl's memory. I was born in Namtao, Laos, during the war, secret war in Laos. My father, who was barely a teenager, served in the army before I was born. He continued to serve as a soldier after he and my mother married and has already given life to my younger brother and I. My maternal grandfather also served in the war. He was not fortunate enough to survive the war, leaving my grandmother and young children to escape from Laos in the midst of chaos, in the midst of unknown. A specific memory flashbacks I have about my grandfather consist of blood, violence, torture, flies swarming all over the village, and then death in the hands of the communist Pipe Out Lao soldiers. This is because he was buried halfway in the middle of the village after being tortured for many, many months. From there, our family was subject to numerous threats, tortures, tortures as well as communist soldiers coming to the village and into our home whenever they wanted. They were there to do their job, to protect their family, to capture soldiers who fought with the CIA, who fought against them. They tortured children and women. They took our foods, destroyed our homes, our gardens, and our livestock. They killed our people, didn't matter the gender or the age. After my maternal grandfather passed away, my father went to hiding in order to protect his own life, along with my mom, myself, and my younger brother. My mother was left alone to defend for herself and two little ones. She lived in fear, not knowing when the communist soldiers would return to interrogate her or torture her in order to find dad. She also had the responsibility to provide food and shelter for us. I remember having oranges shoved into my mouth in the middle of the night in order to keep me quiet while we were attempting to escape from Laos to Thailand, crossing the Mekong River. I remember failing at least once, not being able to escape to Thailand and returning to a home that has been ransacked because neighbors came into our home and garden and took what we couldn't take with us. I remember seeing dead bodies on the trials and her gunshots. I remember the smell of blood and of dead bodies, as well as the frank facial expression on my family's face like it just happened yesterday. I couldn't understand it at the time, but I've been able to put the pieces together after talking to my parents when I became an adult. I remember going into an isolated, deserted area and was forced with a bandana used to cover my mouth. I saw my mother, another woman, and a soldier rushing us to a hidden cave. I thought we were going to die that day. My mother and a young woman was frightened for their life as well. I can still smell the dead body odors on the soldier's shirt that made my intestines and stomach turn just as it, do just as it does right now. My heart was pounding, sweating, and the thought that it was the end of my life. To this day, it still frightens me as I remember this. I thought it was our turn, it was my turn. I finally shared these memories with my mother and father and was told the soldier was my father, who was in hiding. My mother, her friend, and I were there to give food to, my, to him. My mother cried and said, 
She had no idea I was impacted by the war and was frightened as she was. My mother also confided that she was frightened because she also didn't know the soldier was my father at the time because the rumors that we heard was that he was already dead. Apparently, my mother and I had made numerous failed trips into the jungle right before the battlefield to provide the basic necessities to keep dad alive. One can look at it as that day being a frightened day, but another way to look at it was a blessed day. A blessed day because my mom finally confirmed dad was alive. Among my father's group of soldiers, he was the only one that survived, with the exception of his commanding officer. Dad was a young boy with hardly any military experience. He was lost, he was hungry, and he was in a hideout for months. When he finally escaped from the battlefield of the communist soldiers, he was so gaunt looking that no one, including his own father, couldn't recognize him. Friends and family, as well as village members, were crying because his father said, his own father said, younger brother, who are you? What is your name? I've never seen you before. Could you imagine your own father asking you this question? After you survived so much, or did so much to survive to see your family? When I was in grad school, I had the opportunity to be in a classroom the professor was a psychologist. He showed a video, a movie called Split Horn. I've seen this video and I actually have used this video for trainings myself. However, that day, it was doomsday for me. Maybe it was in the midst of wartime discussions, pain, suffering, discrimination. But as they were sharing, the professor said, something in the lines of honoring the Hmong people for their fight during the secret war. I was enraged because the video clipping that they show were men, young boys, holding huge guns, and the face that I saw was my father's face. I ended up teaching the class that day because I was bawling, I was crying. I told the professor that was not appropriate. He apologized, and I ended up teaching the cultural competency class that day. My refugee camp experience is a little bit different. Again, it's coming from a young girl's perspective. My family and I stay at Panani Kum, Thailand camps for several months. Our stay there consists of my parents learning the basic um, English words, learning how to turn on the stove, electricity, learning how to use a pen, learning how to sign their name, the alphabets. They were learning the values of money because of, because of where they're from, the villages, the mountains, they don't have money. They don't, you don't need to know the value of money you barter for services or for goods. For the most part of the life in Pinatikam, it was fair or pleasant depending on which tribe group you were. But I think because we are men, a lot of, it, a lot of the um, individuals don't recognize us, so we're always pushed to the side or what they say, we get the leftovers. And they get the hill tribes uh, mixed up. They change our um, last names to make it fit, to make it where it's comfortable for them. They change our birth dates, the year we were born, which is why you see a lot of men or Asian um, folks' birthdays of June 15th. I think we should have a birthday party on June 15th for everybody. <laughs> In the refugee camp, um, after being retrained and how to reprocess our brain and what's right and what's not right, and how to become the U.S. citizen, we had numerous medical checkups. And once that was done, we were sponsored by a pastor and his wife, along with a ch Christian church family, to Olympia, Washington. That was probably December of 1982. There, there was a lot of, if you want to focus on us, it's flying now. It's just in the beginning, I wanted you to see the journey of my previous life. Um, in the United States, um, it was very different. I, you know, where me and we um, came to a town of primarily um, Caucasians, English speaking, small town. Um, so it was very difficult to communicate. So we utilized Sesame Street to learn the English language. Sesame Street was my best friend, but I don't think it's playing anymore. I remember specifically, my hair was cut very short. Um, I have brothers, two younger brothers. So my sponsor automatically or assumed that I was a boy. They enrolled me in a boys' school. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was interesting and fun. Um, I had boys' underwears on. Uh, my husband probably doesn't want to know that. <laughs> um, in, in class, I saw the kids raising their hand. Whenever the teacher spoke, they raised their hands. So I raised my hand. I wanted to comply. But then she would pick on me, and I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I got in trouble. Um, when we were in PE, you had to change clothes, and quickly enough, the teacher found out I wasn't a boy and talked to my parents and the sponsor about it. I think my parents got in a lot of trouble, but I don't think it was fair because they didn't know what they were doing. And unfortunately, they, we didn't they didn't have an interpreter at that time to ask the specific questions. What I wanted to talk about is acculturation, the process of acculturation. I think that um, in, in class, you know, in schools, I think a lot of children get bullied. That when you're, when you're from a different country, you don't know the language, clothing is unfamiliar to you. Clothing is familiar in that um, it's limited. Limited in terms of the products, but in this country, the clothing is more diverse. So you, when you go to school, you wear certain outfits and you get um, targeted, you get picked on. So a lot of the comments were like, you know, you're not good enough to be here, you don't belong in this country, a lot of discriminatory statements, which I won't repeat today. Um, in fourth grade, um, when I wrote in, in, in fourth grade, I couldn't even, I didn't even know the alphabets. I didn't know how to read or write. So they got me, I guess it's called bilingual aids. They tutor me. By the end of fourth grade, I had excel um, all of their mathematics, the multiples, like the one, the one times one factors, the tens, and to, at that point, it was good for that I mastered that, but at the same time, then I became even more of an outcast because I didn't belong with the other classmates who were also refugees, and I also didn't really belong with mainstream classmates. Um, so that's, that was hard for me. And also, my mother was very um, focused on raising me to be a very traditional Mian mom or me and future wife. My father, on the other hand, recognized that I have certain talents that probably should be utilized. Um, so between mom and dad, dad advocated a lot for me to go to school and try to compromise with my mom. So because of my father, I believe, I was able to continue higher education with his support. And I'm glad that he made that possible for me. A lot of, you know, I'll share two examples, and I think I'll cut my time sh uh, at that point. Um, one of the most impacting incident I had was I was probably about eight months pregnant with our second child. Both my husband, my husband was working two jobs. He was in college. I was working one job. I happened to be home early that day, went to the mailbox to open the mailbox to get my letters. A, a man, an older, an elderly man, a Caucasian elderly man, came and approached me. And I was, I was frightened for my life, to be honest. Um, he, oh, I was in a sports car. I, you know, I was proud of my sports car. We paid for it, and I opened the mailbox, got my letter, got in the car. But he grabbed my door and wouldn't close it and wouldn't let me get into the vehicle. And he, I don't know if he was intoxicated at that time, but he, he was very angry. Um, to the point where I felt that my life was in danger and he, he told me to go back to my country and he told me what he had to do to get his life back to the United States and that he was very, very angry to see someone like me here in his own, own home soil. I was, for some reason, I, I spoke up after, t you know, taking a step back, I spoke back to him. I, I said to him, I said, it's very, something like, it's really unfortunate that you're feeling this way because I also feel the same but in a different perspective in that I lost my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, and I kind of explained to him what had happened. He, he cried, he was in tears, and I, I didn't know he was my neighbor. Uh, months later, um, I think he, maybe he, was, he thought about it, and um, he apologized, and unbeknownst to me, we also worked for the same department. Um, a lot, so a lot, out of that, there's a lot of fruit out of that um, because I, I understand the anger. I understand because you know um, when when you're angry at that point, you you want to not that it's appropriate, but you share it, and then sometimes you regret it. So out of that, the friendship developed, um, and a lot of education developed, and I started doing a lot of speaking in community events to share about the Mian and Lao people. The second one was. Um, not too long ago, I would say about maybe two years ago. I, for a long, long time, I, I had a lot of experiences with discrimination because of my, the color of my skin, where I was from. 
but uh, for, for a good period of time, I didn't experience that. So two years ago, and I'm more outspoken now. <laughs> I'm not as shy as I was. I was, I was at a gas station. A group of young folks came out of their vehicle. I was gassing up my car. They kept making remarks. I said, you know what, May, just, just ignore them. It's OK. It's not worth it. But I couldn't ignore them because there were so many of them. They just kept going, going, going. So I finally took my phone, took a picture of their vehicle with a license plate. I figured if something happens, somebody would know, uh, you know in terms of calling the police. I only did it for my safety. But they came over and asked me why I took the picture. I said, well, what do you think? And they said, well, you got to call the police. I said, only if something happens to me. And then they said, well, nothing's going to happen to you. Can you delete it? And I looked at the young boy, and he looked frightened, so I deleted the picture. And I said, I'll see you in the ER someday. Someday you'll need my help. I said that, and they thought about it. And I didn't think anything much about it. But six months into it, I was calling to the ER for a consultation. Didn't recognize who he was. I did my consultation. I gave my instructions of what I thought to the doctor. The doctor did what they needed to do. Two months later, the young man and his family came into my office, apologized, and I still didn't get what he was saying. I said, you don't need to apologize to me. That's part of my work. He said, well, you did say, I'll see you in the ER. I said, I did? <laughs> I don't remember saying that. He explained the scenario, and then he wanted to know how I came to this country and how he can be a better person, and how he can advocate his fr friends and his church groups to, to react more properly when they meet someone that's a threat to them or unknown to them. So yes, we, there are a lot of sacrifices, a lot of emotional pain, a lot of anger, a lot of hatred. But at the same time, through that process, there will be healing. Some healings are sooner than later. Hopefully, it's sooner for most of us. But, but we're all human. We all, we all face similar pain. The circumstances may be different, but the pain is the same. And if we keep that in mind, I think the world will be at more peace, and we will be more understanding and out more tolerance of each other. And I'm very grateful for the McCown Foundation, as well as the steering committee, for making this event to happen so that we can at least start the dialogue and to get to that healing together. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, May. And uh, next we have Philip Wanto Chow. You may begin, please. Thank you uh, for uh, being here today. Uh, I'm thankful that I was uh, asked to be a part of the committee to uh, be a part of this journey, and it's been a great process uh, to make great friendships. And, uh, and I was asked to share uh, part of my story as a young child uh, coming to America. Uh, so be but before I, I do that, I would like to acknowledge my father and my mom, uh, who are in attendance today. Uh, my father is Fu Tsiu Se Chow, and my mom is Koi Koi Se Chow. Uh, my father, as a young man, was a part of the CIA uh, grounds forces, just as you uh, have heard the sh stories that have been shared today. Uh, my dad was... Uh, deployed twice during that time, and before the uh, war had come to a close, my parents fled to northern Thailand, uh, that's, and that's where I was born. Um, some of my fondest memories of Thailand uh, include uh, just memories of my family. Uh, there's a pond from, from uh, just my uh, memories. Uh, from my, uh, there was a pond near our home, and every time they would dry up, uh, my family would go outside, and we would uh, try to grab all the fish that we can uh, that are, you know, flapping and uh, in the muddy crevices. So that's that's one fond memory of mine as a young boy. Also, uh, there was another time during the monsoon season where, you know, the wind's blowing really hard, and my my brothers and I, and my my uh, siblings and I, uh, we would go out and pick up all the mangoes that we could find. Um, and, and it was just really fun and scary at the same time. So that was kind of life from my perspective, from, from my recollection, um, some of the fond memories. And then I'd like to share about the refugee camps. In, 18, or in 1989, 
we lived in uh, two refugee camps, uh, one in Napo and Panat. Uh, before entering one of the camps, I remembered we had to stay in a jail, a uh, jail cell. I remember the bars uh, that were there. We had to stay, I don't know how long, but a certain time before we could go into the camp. For us kids, life, for the most part, was pleasant. Uh, I don't remember a lot of difficult memories or situations that my parents would probably have. And as, as you've heard, the other stories have been shared. But uh, I remember, uh, for example, we were given sardines that were delivered in blocks of ice. And I remember them just rationing the sardines or the chickens uh, into for each family that, that were there. Uh, so that was a, uh, just a just distinct memory. I also uh, watched a, a movie of a flying dog, a really big dog. And uh, to this day, I've learned that it's called The Never Ending Story. I didn't know what that was. I just remember that dog flying with really big ears. And so, so that's another memory. And then I also remember uh, how us little kids, we would uh, go and in, in the refugee camps, we would go and look for mango seeds. And by collecting the mango seeds, we could trade it in. And we would get what they call kanom, kanom kai, or cookies or some kind of cracker. And so that, we were busy doing that while my parents were probably doing their ESL classes or <laughs> working. Us kids were working to earn some snacks. And so that was a fun memory. Um, in March uh, 1990, um, I didn't know that we were moving 8,000 miles away. So we started our journey to the US uh, from Bangkok uh, to Hong Kong, and then to Seattle, San Francisco, and then finally to Reading. Uh, we had uh, relatives at that time who sponsored us. So of all the places in the US we could come to, uh, we, we came to Reading. So this is a special place. I remember uh, particularly during the flight from San Francisco to Reading, you know how it gets very turbulent at times. And so that was a very turbulent time uh, because I just remembered we were it felt like we were falling and, and just constantly falling. And my mom told me that uh, I was so scared. I, I kept yelling, thai lo, thai lo. And that means, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm, we're going to die in Mian. And uh, just screaming and yelling. And so that's what, uh, that's what my mom told me. And I, I remember that. It was very scary. And, uh, and another interesting part about that was, um, there were several Mian families that were on the same flight. And I remember them also screaming and, and also a lot of uh, throwing up. <laughs> and so I was very thankful, well, at least from my perspective now, that they gave us brown paper bags. <laughs> so that was very helpful and useful during that time. So I'm going to share a little bit about uh, growing up in Reading uh, as a young boy. I was turning six, so uh, for me, I was very thankful that I, uh, since being, uh, since I was fairly young, I was able to acquire the English language in school, and I always enjoyed learning, and I even wrote a book about it uh, as a fifth grade student, and it's on display outside here, and it kind of, you know, gave a chronology of just from what I remembered the journey that we came, so. Um, so just growing up in school, um, just thankful that I was able to be educated. And uh, I, all, I grew up, we grew up in the, the hilltop apartments. And uh, many of the Mian folks have come out of that place. And, <laughs> and so they could probably share their own stories. But one of my favorite games was Cops and Robbers, which I'm sure some of you have played before. I was probably the cop. <laughs> Anyways, uh, most of the time I had good experiences. Uh, with my peers, but one time um, I remember a student, you know, just like what May shared, um, you know, probably didn't have the understanding. Uh, and so I remember the comment, something along the line of, you know, you should go back to your own country. And, you know, as a young boy, you know, you don't really know how to explain that, um, you know, why we're here and, and like what we're doing today. 
But I just remember, you know, being hurt. I didn't know how to respond to that situation. Um, but anyways, uh, I was uh, able to make, you know, many friends uh, from different ethnic groups, uh, wh you know, whites, blacks, men. And, and I remember, you know, we shared a lot of top ramen noodles. And that, that was, you know, very fun. You put the, you know, the seasoning and the hot sauce and, and you put it in and shake it up. And we had a great time, you know, just growing up in, in mistletoe school. So anyways, uh, uh, that was kind of like my elementary years. And, and I remember as a sophomore in high school, I realized that I've always wanted to be a teacher. And uh, it was a great stepping stone because I, thankfully I was uh, the first in my family uh, to be able to go to college and to, uh, you know, go through school and graduate. And I'm grateful uh, to my parents for their support, sacrifices, and perseverance um, that have allowed me to be able to share with them uh, during graduation. Uh, my family was able to come down, uh, go down to San Diego area. And so, um, and so after graduation, uh, I decided to come back home uh, to Reading. Uh, for me, I realized that Reading is my home and my community. I am thankful that I received a great education throughout my life, and of all the, from all the people that you know were able to shape me and mold me and to be a part of my my life. And so it was great that I could come home and find a job. Uh, and it was during the time that it was really hard to get a teaching job. Uh, it was during the housing crisis. Uh, and so, but thankfully, I was able to, to start teaching right away. And, and for me, I realize now that because of the education I received, uh, I am a privilege to be able to share that, uh, you know, that knowledge I receive with uh, the, the youth of today uh, at Rother's uh, Elementary. Uh, actually, I first started at Reading Christian School, and now I've been teaching at Rother Elementary. And to be able to share with them my life story and to also to show them the value of education. And um, you'll, you'll notice this picture. I'm, I'm going to close with this picture. If you look at this picture, um, you are looking at a kid. You, you might say, you know, you're looking at a, uh, a kid in the refugee camp. And people may s uh, not see very much. And for a lot of us, it may be similar. Um, but my life shows that, you know, if you work hard, and you don't give up, you can achieve you know, the, the goals and dreams that you have. And then I was thinking earlier, and, and not just to achieve those goals and dreams for yourself, because then you're just looking at yourself, but to be able to use those gifts, those talents that you've been given, and to be able to share with others and make an impact in the lives of others. So I'm very grateful that you know, all of you have uh, come today to hear these stories and, and the time that I have to be share my story. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now next we have his, his, uh, his wife, Somnuk Oliapon. Uh, ciao. Thank you. Like, please. Okay, Spidey. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, um, it's been a long, 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 you know, just preparation for this event, but we're so thankful for each one of you that are, you are here. Um, my father became a soldier in 1970 and fought with the U.S., and my parents were married in 1975, and in 1976, my father was imprisoned in the concentration camp. My father was not there when I was born, and I wouldn't, wouldn't meet him again until I'm about two to two and a half years old. Desiring to have a safe and a better life for our family, my parents sold all their belongings to purchase a ticket on a boat crossing the Mekong River. Their plan was to make it to Thailand and safely enter the refugee camp. The first boat we boarded hit a rock. I remember being tossed off the boat as others scrambled to get off the boat before it sank. We waited without knowing what will happen, but we had hoped that our journey would not stop there. Another boat finally came, and seven of us boarded to continue on our journey. Arriving in Thailand, my family were held in a holding cell at a police station for one week. We didn't receive food or water. My aunt, who was living in Thailand at that time, came to deliver food every single day for us, to us. A week after completing our paperwork to apply to go to the U.S., we headed to the refugee camp. 
At Nong Kai's refugee camp, we lived in a square, one-bedroom building. It had cold cement walls and a tin roof. Every time it rains, you can hear the raindrops at its, as it hits the tin roof. And at nighttime, I remember hearing geckos. You know, whatever sound they make, they don't say, they don't say geiko. <laughs> but they make that sound, and they would crawl the walls of the cement cold walls that we had. It was a place of safety for our family, and it, would, it became our home. We were in Thailand's refugee camps for five years, and before our next relocation, my grandmother passed away. In January, in January of 1986, my family relocated to Manila refugee camp in the Philippines. There, my parents had to do their part by working two hours and going to English class every day. My mom worked with the Catholic Church by sewing, and my dad would clean the local hospital clinic. Life for me was going to school and studying, and there I learned my very first English song. I, I'm sure a lot of you learn it. If you're happy and you know, clap your hand. <laughs> and I was introduced to Michael Jackson, the king of pop. I saw his We Are the World um, music video for the first time was there in the Philippines. I also saw an important movie that would later be the centerpiece of my life as well, the Jesus film. In June of 1986, when I was nine, my family received words that we were heading to the U.S. We were told this land is a place where money grows on trees and where new life can begin. Life in America was not easy and money did not grow on trees. All five of us packed like sardines in a two, into a two-bedroom apartment shared with my uncle and four of his family members. My parents did not know how to speak English or read English. Life was not easy for me and my siblings as well. Kids at school were not friendly. At times, I was told to go back to where you came from. I did not understand why would someone say such a thing to someone else. Here I am with my family, trying to survive in a new foreign land. Our clothes were hand-me-down from a local church that would come to our home with a brown, large brown paper bag filled with food. And one thing I remember was having my very first taste of Wonder Bread and bologna. <laughs> I love peeling the red strip off the bologna and eating it. I know it's, kind of, it's gross right now, but it was really good. Uh, with a soft, moist piece of Wonder Bread. Life eventually got better. My parents slowly learned to speak English and work hard at their jobs. My, my brother and sister and I were thriving in school. I was fully immersed in the American culture, ate American food, played American sports, had American friends. I was in the in-group, but at home was a different story. My parents just didn't understand why we wanted to play sports. Why did we, why did we want to put a Christmas tree up? Why do we want to celebrate Christmas? They just didn't understand, but for us kids, we just wanted to fit in. We wanted to be part of America. I love my mom's cooking and speaking our language, but I also enjoy hamburgers and speaking in English as well. I felt like I was living a 1.5 life. I wasn't a first generation. I wasn't a second generation. I was stuck right there in the middle. As I grew older, I became an interpreter, a Czech writer, a bill reader for my parents. I was the first to graduate from high school, and I can tell that my parents were super proud, very proud. They also placed a large hope on me that I would be more successful than them. As a believer of Jesus Christ, I wanted to impact people's lives in a positive way. I decided to attend Liberty University, a Christian school, to grow my personal faith and pursue a nursing degree. On the way to my very first week of school, my parents were sitting in the front seat and I was in the back seat. My father looked straight into th um, to my eyes through the rearview mirror and said these words, your mother and I have something important to tell you or to talk to you about. And now I was like, okay, um, the car is going 70 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. On the other side is a really steep hill or cliff. I can't really jump out of the car right now. <laughs> but I continue to listen. And he said, we would like you to concentrate on your study, finish your school, get a good job, don't think about boys. Don't associate with boys. Just finish, finish school. And then maybe, maybe you'll get married one day. <laughs> After graduating from college, 
20 years after coming to the US, I decided to go back to Southeast Asia to teach English at a school in Bangkok, Thailand. From my trip, I learned that I did not need to lose the Lao part of my identity in order to fit in as an American. I've also journeyed through feelings of disconnecting myself from my past in order to fit in, but now I've learned to embrace who I am, where I've come from. I also appreciate, I appreciate my father's hardship as a soldier and grateful to my parents for their strength to give our family a new life in America. If I can give a title to my story, it would be from sticky rice to one of bread and back. Thank you. <laughs> So, so the story continues. This is our, our story. I knew that Mickey was coming to visit our friends, and I would only have four days uh, to get to know her. So the doorbell rang, and my friend May said, Hey, it's only Philip, Ton's friend. He hangs out with Ton all the time, and he just want to join us for dinner. I didn't think anything about it, um, but it felt a little weird because they kept leaving us in the living room together. And uh, that night, I said, what is there to do in Reading, by the way? So I thought of two things, uh, the Sundial Bridge and the shooting range. Well, I... <laughs> so I've never seen the Sundial Bridge and always wanted to shoot a gun. <laughs> So the next day, uh, Philip joined us, and I was encouraged uh, to ride with him. My friends decided to stick their eight-year-old son as a chaperone in the back seat. <laughs> when we were in the car, Philip turned to me and asked, What qualities are you looking for in a future husband? <laughs> are you serious? I don't even know you. I'm not going to answer that question. I said, yes, I'm serious. Well, I'm not going to give you an answer. At that moment, we arrive at his, um, our friend's house, and I actually buckle my belt and jump out of the car. Is it something that I said? <laughs> so anyways, we went to the sundial uh, and, and then the shooting range. I was able to show her how to safely handle a gun and that you didn't, you didn't have to be afraid of a gun. Oh, well, I felt safe and was not afraid. Hmm. And I thought to myself, well, this guy is really good at teaching. So I decided uh, to uh, ask Mickey out because I was uh, first drawn to her uh, faith in God. Uh, and also, she was very beautiful inwardly and outwardly. And so I asked her, you know, would, would you like to go with me uh, or would you like to go to dinner? Um, and also, we could stop by the sundial again because at nighttime, <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> Um, no thanks. I don't really think I need to see sun the sundial again at nighttime. And I already saw it during the day. And uh, besides, I have to babysit my friend's uh, kids. At that moment, my friend came to me and just said, uh, just go out with him. I asked him the dreaded question, are you setting me up? I don't even know him. Who is this guy? Can I trust him? My, f uh, my friend said to me, we love you both. You are like our brother and our sister. And if we had a sister, we would want him to marry her. So out of respect for my friends, and tr I trusted what they said, um, but I still was not convinced and decided to use a lifeline and phone another friend. Yeah. My, fr <laughs> my friend in Virginia said, um, well, you prayed for someone who would be straightforward in getting to know you, so just go out with him. So we went on our first date to the Olive Garden. Another popular restaurant in Reading. Where, where else can you go? <laughs> Too bad they didn't have famous Dave back then. <laughs> Anyways, uh, our date went well, and, and I really liked her. Uh, but I didn't know how to uh, take the next steps uh, to get to know her better. So I said something in our conversation, uh, um, something along the line of, let's just stop here. And I could tell she was very confused. And uh, however, I knew that since she's only here for a few days, I had to do something. Well, my last night at my friend's house was really weird. Uh, my friend left Philip again and me in the living room with an excuse that they had to put their kids to bed early because of school the next day. They turned off all the lights. It was just like a spotlight <laughs> on us. 
And I'm thinking, it's my last night. Doesn't my friend care to hang out with me before I fly out the next day? So I knew that it, things were a little weird, uh, especially after that first date. And, but in my heart, I knew that I had to make a choice. And I could kind of uh, just go our own ways or, or, you know, I needed to make a choice. So what I did, I, I chose to be brave. And I asked her for her email. Uh, <laughs> why do you need my email address? I don't need a friend all the way in Reading. I have plenty of friends in Virginia. Well, the, the real reason was uh, I, w I wanted to get her email was because I was interested in pursuing her uh, for uh, you know, the possibility of marriage as well. Well, when I heard what he said, I could not help but smile. The four days of getting to know Philip there were many qualities that I liked about him, and I'm glad that he was honest and straightforward with his, his intention, because every girl does not need a friend. We need to know exactly why you're asking us out, <laughs> even, if it's, it was the, even if it's the first date only. <laughs> um, I couldn't believe that I am now in a relationship and heading back home. After two months of talking on the phone, Philip was coming to visit Virginia. I decided to introduce my family to him. A computer was set up when my dad, mom, sister, brother, nephew, nieces all surrounded, just like Seinfeld's like <laughs> TV show or something. Um, and we Skype him. And the first question my dad asked was, do you love my daughter? At that moment, everyone got out, up and left the room. It was just me in the corner and Phil on the screen and my dad sitting there. But you know what, I, w I was embarrassed, but I realized how grateful I am to a father, a father who loved me. If you thought that was straightforward, or if you thought my question to her was straightforward, that was a very straightforward question. Um, <laughs> I, I told him that, you know, at this point, I cannot answer that, but I hope to be able to kind of along that line. But uh, so I survived uh, her uh, father's questionings and uh, and uh, we, we talked and had a great time uh, to get to know each other. And uh, five months later, uh, I asked Mickey to see, I asked her if she would marry me. And she said yes. Um, and now here we are uh, living in Reading. Um, and in July, we will actually be celebra celebrating our six year anniversary. So we hope to continue to share our parents' stories and our stories with our children so that they can be proud of their heritage. We hope that our children would see the strengths in their grandparents, their parents, and the lives that were sacrificed in order for them to enjoy life in America today. Thank you for your time. I am feeling so much gratitude to so many people for so many different reasons um, that I'm a little bit speechless, which is good because we've gone long. So, um, I would like to offer a little bit of time for some question and answer. Um, let's, let's cap it at 20 minutes. Um, and so at this point, I know so many of us in the room have reflections or our own stories to share. Let's start, if we could, with anyone who has questions or something directed to the people on the panel so we can make use of their time when they're here. Does anyone want to start? Thank you so much all for sharing your stories. And I know most of you said that you have children. And I just wanted to know how has their experience been and how much of your own past and, and story have you been able to share with them? And do they feel American? Do they feel conflicted as you did? I'd just love to hear more about that. leaning towards the end culture. He speaks the language very well. He's very interested in um, what my, my, my father's story is, and his story as a soldier, what he went through. Very interested in um, symptoms of PTSD and how he can help the grandfather get through the process. He spends a lot of time with him and the fishing and just telling stories of his mother. And he tells the stories to his friends. He also visits my dad 
my, my youngest, they're about 12 years difference. My youngest is, is not Asian. Teacher told him to, about the Chinese New Year and asked him questions. He stood up and he said, I'm not Asian. I'm not there. <laughs> Came home and asked me what it was about. I, I had a laugh and I explained to him. So we, I think both my husband and I do a very good job teaching um, the Viet culture, the traditions, the language, um, as well as my, my family. My, my family, my parents speak the language of Viet to my children, and they spend much more time with me in that. But um, it also, the child also has to take some responsibility, and I, I think that it just depends so that one generation, my oldest son, does it freely, my middle child does it freely. I, I, you know, I'm just really interested in your the storytelling process and then uh, just for the whole panel, if you could, could just share, um, you know, how often do you, sh have you shared this with other people very much before this and then also just what the process was like, what was difficult, and what was rewarding? Um, for me, um, I've always wanted to write down the history of my family because I, I wanted to share, I want to have something in writing um, to give to share with my daughter and my son. We have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And then to pass on, because I I felt like, from my story, you can tell the disconnection, right? From the moment my dad and I never met until I was two and a half years old. This connection within wanting to, marry, to be an American, but my parents wanted to be something different. They basically say, no English in the house, okay? We only speak our language, that's it. So there was this connection. So I felt like my story was, I want to go back to my roots, you know. I, I, I want to go back and share and um, have these, these memories and this heritage to, for my children and my grandchildren and for them to be proud, you know. And uh, for me, it was really taking the time to interview my dad on the phone and say, Dad, tell me step by step the dates. And they remember. They remember. And I know I got emotional some of the part I share because I felt like, I just felt grateful, you know, for life here, where we are, and remembering that when they first came to the U.S., they didn't speak English. They had to walk everywhere they went, you know. Um, if we felt like we're, we were discriminated, I can't imagine what my parents went through. Trying to find the first job, what can you do? But I'm so thankful that somebody did say, you know what, you're a valued person, I want you to have your first job here that people reach out. So for me, it was a process of really embracing as I, I, as I heard the story from my dad, as I heard the story from my mom, and then also expressing how thankful and grateful I am to them. And I hope that my children would one day feel the same way. I've been living in the United States for nearly one year now. Uh, this is my first time telling the story. Uh, for me to answer, uh, Mark, uh, your question, uh, this is publicly the uh, first time as well. I shared a little bit, I made reference to the autobiography, and I remember uh, when we finished that book, um, um, the Lions, I think Lions, uh, Lions Club, you know, the, the, that's very uh, common around here, uh, they actually supported that project, and so, actually I guess that would be, that would be my first time, um, but kind of not in this setting, but, um, so I remember sharing with them the story, and reading the, the book that I wrote, and that, that was a neat experience, but for now to kind of come full circle and to be able to, to, to share and to share bits and, you know, snapshots, obviously we didn't have the time to, uh, you know, have a long time because may, maybe all of you would fall asleep by the time you, you got to us, uh, but uh, it, it, it's been a great, great process. First, it, it allowed me to just remember to appreciate, you know, my parents and my family and, and those that, you 
know, directly were involved in the war. And also, it, it reminded me to be thankful, to be grateful for, you know, um, the U.S. government. Uh, you know, we, we live in a, one of the most privileged nations on earth. And so for us to be, you know, this light and to be you know, a place that we can you know, accept others and, and bring them to America and, and live here and be a part of the United States, you know, that's a great, a great feeling. And to be a part of that community as well now as a teacher. And so it's been great to, for me, for my parents, um, to appreciate, you know, to express appreciation to them and for me to be able to, you know, write all of these uh, stories and memories down so that way my kids, I, I want to, we'd like to teach them to remember, even though they are, you know, so removed from this experience, but to be captured This question is for Dong Seo Kyo and Dong King Kang. I was wondering, you said you were in the POW uh, camp for nine and 11 years. How, how did you do it day by day, year by year? What, what did you draw from? What, uh, how, did, how did you survive? Well, uh, first of all, I, on that time, I thought I could save my life at home. But finally, how can I fight? Everything is uh, on and out. But at that time, I can be, I saw, they eat everything, I saw everything they eat, everything save my life. Every day, we wake up. What can I have? Some nothing. I could believe that they were lying. I could believe that they were lying. They sent back home. Go back and do my work. Keep them. They didn't need it. Okay, it didn't matter. It's a blood. For the life, how many years they said, they said to us when they eat for the rice. Still right. 1952, that price, they seem to us to eat for how many years? For a uh, uh, Vietnam War. That time they received the rice, rice. But that time, 1952, our friends who helped to allow the soldiers to allow the army from that time to fight at them to kill their army to kill them. At that time, Lights, lights, left over, they sit down and sit with us. If I have that, I can be able to save my life.
ปังในวัดจันทร์อ่อนปนังวันศุกร์วันเดียร์ถึงฟรายเดย์นะครับไปฟรายเดย์ตอนกลางคืนเราต้องไปว่าทุกคนสิบคนถึงหกคนมานั่งตรงนี้มาสำรวจบวชตากันเขาว่าสมขาวตัดติ่งสมขาวกันและในหมู่กันเป็นหมู่นั่งหมู่โต๊ะกันและในหมู่นั่งเที่ยวไปหมู่นั่งนี้และเขาว่าคนนี้เห็นเดียงคนนี้คนนี้คนนี้เห็นเดียงนี้และในอาทิตย์นั้นเอาคนได้เห็นเป็นผู้ดีเด่นนะนะเห็นเดียงเก่งกว่าผู้คนเขาเห็นแบบนั้นและวันเสาร์มาตอนเช้าทุกทุกวันเสาร์ครับเขาเดินมาออกในตาแดงไปว่าอยู่เบียงพัดบอกว่าคนเขาคนเขาเนี่ยวันใดเขาต้องการประสบของเมืองพอขุดนองป่าพอขุดนองขุดบ่อนเจ้าหลายเขาไฟทหารไฟแดงเขาไปนะแต่ไปพัดเขาเดินมาออกในงานแดงนะแบบทุกทุกวันเช้าเลยนะทำบ้างแล้วเอาหลายหมวดแล้วขึ้นไปกองลอยไปสำรวจบทไปพวกเราก็เลยได้เห็นดีเห็นของเราเห็นดีของว่าอาทิตย์นี้จะเห็นดีดีอันนี้ดีดีทุกคนที่เห็นจะเป็นแดนอะไรดีให้เขาเนี่ยเป็นการทบทบทำเขาเป็นการคิดในเป็นคนที่มีเรียกเป็นคนที่มีเรื่องการเรียนรู้ของตัวมาสิ่งเสียดีเรื่องของเรื่องสิ่งเดียวเ
sense. That's why they put their claws down there and, and grab and eat as much as possible. You don't see many tomatoes standing up so many times in any video. Fine. That's a lot in one requirement. Watch that video too. She has a video of eating tomatoes. It's so hungry. Yeah. And that's how it survived. And he told me that one thing that survived, that um, really um, kept him mentally, was that one day he would get up and that his wife and kids waited for him. That's one thing that kept him going spiritually. Uh, physically, he did what he can to survive, but spiritually, and that was one way for him to, to be alive, is to have hope that he would see his wife and kids again one day. Yeah. Hey, Dan, would you mind introducing yourself real quickly? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Vinya. I'm the executive director of the Center for Lao Studies, and we uh, have been uh, gathering uh, similar stories as you hear today uh, as part of our uh, YouTube project. Let's do one last question, and then I'll hand this off to the a couple of board members. Thank you. Thank you for sharing of your stories with us. Um, and as I look across uh, all of you as a set of people, I see educators and social workers and elders are raising children here. Um, and so as you were speaking, I was it reminded me uh, of a book that I recently read called Community, The Structure of Belonging. And I think that question of how does one belong is so important. And you've brought us into really complex narratives like that. Uh, and the gentleman who wrote it, Peter Block, said that to belong is to act as an investor, owner, and creator of this place. And as, as a parent who's raising a three-year-old here in Shasta County, I can see that people who are educators and social workers and elders and parents of children are doing that here, each of those investing, owning, and creating this place. So I just want to say thank you. heroes that we are so happy and so proud to have you here. And it's amazing. It took 29 years to speak, but we want you to keep speaking. The other half I want to talk about real just quickly is in 1988, I became the police chief in the Bay. And we saw the Southeast Asian people being treated terribly by the native and Asian people in Shasta County, that you were not respected. in the community that knew the value of your people and was such a great group and what you did for us, the Americans, in the war. We feel that was our fault. Help educate ignorant people, Caucasian people, and many others in this community to realize the value that you gave us and we are today still thankful, but we are today are still very At least I feel we have a few more heroes who have been sung. Thank you all for helping us to do that. For I encourage the front of this room and to everyone in it who opened their hearts and minds and cleared their busy days to make room for something really important. May it continue 